Uh, welcome uh, to uh, sort of our ASI export expert. Sorry, today we have uh, Dr. Uh, Francisco Leone and Dr. Holger Russ, Russ from University of Florida, um, and we are talking to them both about Tolerance Bio, a brand new, newly minted uh, biotech company, and we'll have them um, sort of flesh out the the goal and the mission of this company. Uh, just a little bit, a little bio about each of them. For uh, Francisco Leon, his scientific and corporate mission is the development of interventions to restore immune balance, intercepting and preventing immune-mediated diseases. He's very experienced in the main areas of immunology, immunodeficiencies, allergy, infectious diseases, immuno-oncology, transplantation, and in particular, autoimmunity and vaccines. He's led R&D projects and teams in diverse settings from startups and big pharma and is fluent in all phases of drug development and commercialization. He has expertise in the design and execution of strategies and trials for rapid and cost-effective de-risking of experimental medicines and solutions, also known as rapid go-no-go. -no -go. And he's authored and co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and patents. He's led or participated in the development of several approved products, preventions to plizumab, uh, AZ's uh, Benralizumab, <laughs> that was a tongue twister, uh, BMS's Abatacept, um, Belatacept, and Janssen's Ustakinumab, and uh, Guselkumab. These are all very uh, uh, good tongue twisters. The next entrepreneurial chapter in his career is Leading Tolerance Bio in Pursuit of Radically New Strategies to Manipulate Immune Tolerance, and with the pioneering scientific co-founder, Holder Russ um, and experienced founding team, Phil Ball, Justin Vogel, and supportive investors will stand on the, or they say that they are standing on the shoulders of giants and focusing on thymic preservation and regeneration with the goal to prevent and treat immune um, diseases. A short bio uh, for Dr. Russ. He is interested in elucidating the underlying mechanisms that lead to the development of diabetes in humans. One specific focus of the lab is to investigate and elucidate molecular mechanisms that govern human beta cell development, maturation, replication, and function under steady state conditions and responses to stresses. Dr. Russ lab was among the first three groups demonstrating the generation of functional beta cells from human pluripotent stem cells under cell culture conditions. It's now possible to generate patient-specific cell lines with the ability to differentiate um, into any cell type, thus enabling the study of beta cell functions in a specific genomic context. And the Rust Lab is taking advantage of recent breakthroughs in genomic editing technology to establish different inducible CRISPR-Cas9 systems to facilitate rapid and precise gene modification of pluripotent stem and differentiating cell, uh, cell der uh, derivates. While the pancreatic beta cell is key to glucose homeostasis, the thymus glab gland also pays a critical uh, role in development of type 1 diabetes, and the Rust Lab was also the very first to demonstrate the successful generation of human embryonic stem cell-derived thymic epithelial cells, or TECs, by directed differentiation. And moving forward, uh, his lab is determined to combine in vitro-derived thymic epithelium with human T-cell progenitors, either in vitro or in vivo studies, um, to uh, dissect the diverse uh, aspects of autoimmunity in a strictly human context. Uh, welcome to you both, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're really interested today uh, to hear more about this uh, new uh, adventure and company. And uh, I don't know if you want to take it away with some slides or just have a, you know, or just discuss. Yeah, we have a few slides for you. And first of all, uh, thank you, Monica, for the opportunity. And it's great to see so many known faces, experts in T1D and in the thymus as well. So it's, it's great. Um, this is going to be a, a good session and we're happy to make it interactive. I know Q&A goes through you, Monica. Um, yes, we have, so a, you can, you can feel free to drop questions in the chat um, throughout the, the, the time where we're on, uh, on the talk. Great. So Holger and I are going to share a few slides. Can you see the slide? Yes, looks great. Great. All right. So as, as you said, Monica, we are truly standing on the shoulder of giants. Um, and that is, that is what drug development is about, right? You always 
to learn from decades of work that others have done before you. And then you just try to advance it one more step. And that's what we did with Teplisma. And that's what we're going to do with Holger's work in the thymus. He has himself st stood in the shoulder of giants and taken the science one step closer to the clinics. So we've put together a, a great team of drug developers to try to translate Holger's science into products. And our focus after prevention, where we really got the taste of immune tolerance with teplizumab, our focus is to try to double down on immune tolerance, try to go to the, the source of immune tolerance in children. And that is, of course, the thymus. As you know, you, you all know the thymus is responsible for inducing and maintaining T cell tolerance in early life. And of course, immune tolerance underpins a lot of the remaining unmet medical need. You can, in very simplified fashion, consider these five disease areas as issues of immune tolerance. To cancer is excessive immune tolerance to harmful self, autoimmunity, insufficient immune tolerance to harmless self, infection, excessive tolerance to harmful non-self, and then allergy and graft rejection are insufficient tolerance to harmless non-self. Obviously, uh, when the thymus is working properly early in life, individuals are uh, well balanced from an immune tolerance point of view, but throughout our lives, we start to accumulate episodes of loss of tolerance or cancers grow inside us that are able to induce tolerance when they shouldn't. And that's what we're going to focus on. The thymus establishes immune tolerance by, again, oversimplifying, by inducing positive and negative selection in T cells. So first, a T cell progenitor or a thymocyte to survive the passage through the thymus needs to be able to engage with our HLA on antigen presenting cells. So paradoxically, all the T cells in our body start as autoreactive, right? Or most of them, because <clears throat> most of the peptides presented in the thymus are self antigens initially. But of course, the thymus has a mechanism to prevent autoimmunity, which is to negative select the T cells that bind too strongly to our self antigens and or to turn them into regulatory T cells, antigen specific regulatory T cells. So when this process works well, our adaptive immune system, our T cells are able to recognize pathogens, but it is an immune system that's tolerant to self. This process takes place primarily in the first couple of years of life. And it's a very resource intensive process that eliminates billions of cells. Um, so there are several evolutionary theories um, that consider that perhaps thymic involution, which takes place very rapidly in, in childhood and accelerates in puberty, perhaps that is an evolutionarily conserved process. It's adaptive, it's beneficial. However, some recent data shows that when people look at centenarians, when people look at elderly populations that are maintaining good health, there's a good correlation with preserving thymic function. And recently, the group of doctors Scadden in Boston at MGH Harvard, they did a very good case control study looking at several decades of experience in cardiothoracic surgery when patients had their thymus either preserved or removed, depending on the approach of different surgeons, because the thymus is in the way of 
get into the heart. So when patients, and they were adults, had their residual thymus removed in the next five years, there was a substantial increase in mortality, primarily due to cancer, and there was an increase in autoimmunity as well. So the notion that's emerging is that perhaps it is appropriate to preserve the thymus into later in life. And that is one of the goals of Tolerance Bio. So if we just try to summarize what's the problem and what's the proposed solution, the problem will be thymic involution and loss that leads to immune disease and mortality. And there are three, you can bucket all causes into three. Age-related thymic involution, acute thymic involution caused by, of course, surgery, medications, chronic use of steroids, immune suppressants, chemo, as well as severe infections and inflammation. And finally, there are congenital thymic defects. The George syndrome is the most well-known congenital athemia, but there are thymic defects as well in Down syndrome, in, in Goods syndrome. So there are multiple reasons why thymosis may be suboptimal. And what we are trying to do is build on Holger's science to try to restore thymic function with a bioengineered induced pluripotent stem cell-derived thymus. And that will be thymic organoids that are grown in the lab and transplanted into people. And in parallel, use our expertise in drug repositioning to try to identify drugs that can delay and prevent natural and accelerated thymic involution. So let me now pass this to Holger to go over um, how he has developed thymic organoids that are able to create diversity in, in animal models. Thank you, Francisco. And Thank you, Monica, for this lovely introduction. Um, okay, so I take it for the science part. So we've been interested for, for quite a long time now in using direct differentiation to develop um, approaches to generate thymic epithelial progenitor cells. Now, these progenitor cells can give rise to text thymic epithelial cells that are functional. So it's the step before. Now, when we started out, we really heavily relied on the experience from our work in pancreas and maybe recognizing some of the challenges associated with this um, um, and work. Uh, so one of them is that we started off using um, multiple cell lines from different sources, embryonic stem cells, as well as induced pluripotent stem cells generated by different reprogramming methodologies and also generated from different cell sources. And that was really to avoid this bias that happens um, somewhat unintentional, but that you have a workhorse cell line where you gear all your, your, your protocol optimizations towards this one cell line. And while stem cell lines, while it's not that widely discussed, it's very well appreciated that they actually have differential capacity to differentiate. So everything I show you is done in multiple cell lines, really with this key of developing universal um, uh, differentiation protocols. We also have by now um, reduced this process and have different pathways to get there with key uh, modulations, which we touch on. And already with the mind of, can we now take what we discover in the lab into a more manufacturing um, commercial setting, it is important to be able to upscale the, the production of these cells. And there our experience using suspension culture for um, pancreas differentiation also comes very readily uh, uh, handy to us. So, so, so we have reduced some of these data I showed you in, in 3D already. So to start off, what we do is we start with pluripotent stem cells and then we go through steps of differentiation along the developmental trajectory, which natural, which we know from animal models to give rise to thymic epithelial progenitors. We can do qPCR and find the markers we wanna see 
Fox and one probably most um, uh, important. And we can use uh, antibody staining for proteins, surface proteins, APCAM and CD205, which uh, give us an approximation and the ability to isolate PEP cells. So with this, and this has been published, we established a somewhat universal protocol that we use for many different lines to generate thymic epithelial progenitors. But at this point, we still don't know, is this the right pathway and can those cells be functional? So we use the model, which when Francisco said, standing on, on shoulders of giants, right? Which we also employed for earlier work at UCSF. And I saw that Audrey is here. Um, so we used the a thymic newt mouse. That mouse doesn't have a thymus, but has the T cell progenitor compartment. And when supplied with either a mouse or a human fetal thymus, can educate at least partially that T cell progenitor compartment, which gives rise to functional T cells. So when we do this transplantation under the kidney capsule and we look for structures within the grafts, we find areas that resemble thymic structures. We find both keratin eight and uh, five and double positive cells. Keratin five has a marker for m tags, double positive developing tags. But more importantly, when we now look at the T cell compartment, these are mouse T cells, we find positively selected mouse T cells surrounding these grafts. And when we look at CD4, CD8, either by IF, we find double positive cells, or we do flow-based uh, analysis of the grafts after harvesting them, we find um, appreciable um, a population of double positive cells as well as single positive cells. Now, these single positive cells leave the thymus going to the periphery. When we take, uh, when we isolate CD3 cells from the blood and we do uh, TCR repertoire analysis, and these are the little boxes here. So each bubble is one TCR clone. And so the more bubbles you have and the smaller they are, the more diverse your TCR repertoire is. On the right, you have a wild type, so highly diverse. On the left, you have a control newt mice where you detect a few T cell clones, um, uh, which has been described in the literature. We don't actually know quite well where they originate from. But then in the middle, we have the tap graph bearing newt mice, which really approximate the wild type cells. So on the T cell side, those grafts are able to educate in this Xeno model mouse T cells. When we then look closer at the tag cells that we generate, uh, we did single cell sequencing of grafts from two independent IPS lines, and we compared them to one neonatal primary thymus, um, which we prepared in two different ways. We find it grows um, uh, uh, a categorization of the cells. We find the cell types that we want to see. And when we then zoom in into the tech tap compartment that we define and we recluster those in the red boxes, I uh, hope you can appreciate that we get all the four colors mixed, meaning that on a transcriptional level, the cells, the tech cells we derive from stem cells are indistinguishable from the primary neonatal techs. Um, and so we generate the cell that we want to do. We also have this large population up here, which just consists of IPS derived cells, which we believe are earlier in their, in their developmental uh, state and thus not accessible um, from, from human donor material. Okay. So this gave us basically the proof of principle we can get from a stem cell to the functional tech cell, but this is an Xeno model and it takes really long. So we went back to the drawboard and looked at work. Um, from Dr. Tsunagi and others, um, Guy Crooks, which, which use different culture methods. And, and we tried some out of them to see, can we get further differentiation of TAPs into TAPs under cell culture condition? And the answer is yes. So when we transition our cultures into an air-liquid interface, we trigger this efficient differentiation into TAPs. You can here appreciate that TAPs don't express the MTAC marker keratin-5, but we find it readily here, as well as double positive cells. We can then stain for class two molecules, uh, uh, CD2 or 5 and APCAM, as well as a FOXN1 GFP reporter line in a very nice differentiation. So we get the markers up that we want to have. But at this point, okay, we can define markers as much as we want, right? We want to see the ultimate readout, which is function. So 
we, we went one step back and we established this tri-lineage uh, STO culture where we generate from the same IPS or, or pluripotent stem cell line, uh, hemopotent lymphoid progenitor cells, HEPs, and uh, splenogenic mesenchyme. And when we combine these, in isogenic STOs, we can now read out TAC and uh, T cell development. When we do that, we, we find on qPCR that there is again um, maturation of the TAP to TAC compartment. In the middle here, you can see that we can make these other two cell types, the progenitors, lymphoid progenitors, as well as the mesenchyme, relatively efficiently, and we can freeze them, which makes our life really easier when we establish these cultures. And then when we look at protein, and now this is all compared to um, primary and neonatal human thymus, we find structures that resemble what we see in these primary donors and they stain for the right markers. Okay, now to the functional side. So when we look at the T cell side and we gate and CD45 and then follow up with pre pro T cell marker CD5, CD7, we find an appreciable um, population of double positive cells that is approximating primary thymus. There's still work to be done. And we have single positive cells. We can, of course, also gate on um, surface, TCR, um, alpha beta chain rearrangement, and CD3. And we see similar that we generate or educate these T cells from IPS. We get single positive cells. And I want to point out that we get appreciable numbers of CD4 cells, which is really an advantage to other systems out there which use mesenchymal cell lines to induce with DLL4 or whatnot, which really can facilitate uh, uh, the education of CD8 positive cells, right? But the CD4 compartment is missing. Now, what we got then really excited about is when we look in detail onto um, features and mechanisms critical for negative selection. The process of eliminating autoreactive T cells, right, which we think is really a key feature when you think of um, translating those findings for, for, for treatments for patients. So when we look for the master regulator, or one of the master regulators of negative selection air, we find areas within our STOs that express the protein. And when we then look downstream at the function of air, which induces sporadic expression of tissue restricted antigens within these MTECs, we find um, classical TRAs expressed by qPCR from different germ layers. So it's not off target differentiation. Now, when we conversely look at the T cell compartment of this process, we find CD3 positive selected cells. Some of them express PD-1, which has been associated with ongoing negative selection in the human realm in the thymus. And we also looked um, gated on CD4, CD25. If the master regulator FOXP3 for T regulatory cells is expressed, we find cells that resemble T-Rex in levels comparable to primary thymus. However, it's few cells. We also did qPCR analysis to show that, yes, indeed, as a secondary method, we get upregulation of FOXP3 reliably in our STOs, which we don't see in our TAPs. Again, this process still can be improved, but collectively we have several lines of evidence that there are features of negative selection, which we think is a, a critical component of, of the technology. Thank you, Holger. So obviously for today's conversation, you noticed that Holger uh, showed the expression of IA2 GAD in the STOs, at least at the PCR level, qPCR level. So that is a reason to believe that these organoids could one day be used to address type 1 diabetes, to either remove other reactive cells, triggering processes of negative selection, and or to generate antigen-specific T-Rex, as he has already began to see in the organoids. So in our future development, we will uh, consider autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes, 
celiac disease where we know the antigens, where we can uh, conduct clinical studies that would be giving us an unequivocal answer whether we can do functional negative selection, first in animal models, then in humans. Um, so I think that's probably uh, our formal presentation, but we'd love to engage and and hear your reaction, Monica, and, and, and the audience's reaction. Yeah, thank you so much. This is really, you know, uh, exciting, exciting times for you both. And um, I just wanted to see, you know, just sort of talk a little bit, Francisco, what, you know, what sort of like right now, where, what's your, what are your timelines? What does your funding look like? Um, we know that, you know, Thymune, um, another biotech startup funded by George Church in uh, Kendall Square has just uh, received, you know, like a $37 million um, infusion, uh, was the very first ARPA-H uh, recipient. Uh, as well as, you know, some more um, funding in uh, March 2023 from for seed funding. So it looks like the market is, you know, excite sort of uh, getting established. And uh, perhaps you could kind of flesh out where you guys sit in, in that. Yeah, so obviously, Thymion um, has a few years of, of working with thymic epithelial progenitors, and uh, they are... Um, Definitely a, a, an excellent scientific team. Um, obviously, we are all facing a very challenging field in front of us, and there is room for uh, multiple teams that bring different perspectives. I think we come from the junction of Holger's academic science with the prevention bio team that now uh, works at Tolerance Bio, where we have expertise at getting through the finish line new modalities of therapy. Um, so those conversations with regulators, with payers, with funders are always challenging, and we, we, we've learned quite a bit with the Plisimab. So we hope to put that to the service of patients by translating Holger's science. And um, in terms of our funding, uh, we are a, a nascent company, uh, but in the short lifespan of the company, we've already seen uh, commitments of about two thirds of our uh, seed round. So we will be able to start the company in the near future. I see our JDRF friends as well in the call. So obviously um, we would love to speak with potential investors and, and continue to bring resources to this field and into T1D as well. Great. Um, and then I guess I would also just say, you know, um, we open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand, ask to unmute yourself. Uh, looks like Remy uh, Crusoe from uh, New York has a question. Hi, Remy. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so... I have a conceptual question. Is the idea to generate new antigen-specific T-Rex from like a re basically having the cells acting like a normal thymus, or if grafted, they will serve like more like a lymph node where actual pre-existing autoreactive T cells can recirculate through it and be re-educated through these peripheral MTEX? What 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 is your your thinking? Great question. You want to take a, a sure? Um, yeah, absolutely. Great question. Thanks for joining, Remy. Um, so you know, uh, I'm a bit agnostic. Both are intriguing possibilities we have to do, and we're thinking of them a lot. I, I think it all comes down to that. Surprisingly, little is known about the process of how negative selection in the human realm occurs, right? And this is largely that we don't have or have had the tools maybe so far to to understand this process in more detail. So, of course, we are intrigued by the possibility of can we generate designer T-Rex potentially in a polyclonal manner, right? But then at the same time, this goes back to, okay, 
do you need the designer part or is it good enough if you can recirculate and re-educate um, the immune system and not specifically on the TREC part by providing a functional thymic unit again? Yes, and the answer is we, we just don't know yet. Yeah, leave it at this. But yeah, uh, yeah, we're, we're thinking of this quite hard, how actually to experimentally address it. And uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question, it's cool. Thank you. Great, we have a question um, from uh, Sharini Jiragan. She can't, yeah. uh, she can't sure. unmute, but she says, may I ask, is it possible to isolate thymic tissues, cryopreserve them and probably use them for, fu uh, for future for the expansion of these cells in case required? So um, I also take this one. Thanks for the question. Of course, uh, so it's been on our mind. And um, again, I used the example of, of beta cells uh, that these processes are long to have stopping points where you can have quality control and um, just a stop point for manufacturing is is key in in our opinion and so how well we can do it we can do it to some degree at yes but um it needs to be further expanded the the capabilities this is all kind of like i mean the the purpose of the the or one goal of the company is to take from bench right to bedside so there is a lot of engineering and manufacturing challenges that await us, which we are very well aware. And we were, we haven't and putting more of a team together to, to address them. Yes. Cryopreservation will be, uh, one point that we have to address in detail. And we already have some, uh, preliminary data that it can be done. Uh, great. Are there uh, thymus samples available with NPOD and Exeter databases? So yes, there are for NPOD, certainly. Um, I moved here a year ago, so I'm pretty close to NPOD. Uh, there is accessibility and there's also other uh, 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 sources to, to get primary tissue if needed. I do not know about the Exeter database. I don't know, maybe Francisco knows better. No, I, I don't think so. Just confident about input, as you say. Hmm. Good source. Um, so can we just, uh, I don't see anything else yet, but feel free to raise your hand. We're getting to the end of our time together, but um, I did want to just see if you wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, this whole idea of, um, you know, these TEPs or these, uh, these thymic uh, derivatives that, you know, in context of sort of prevention, in context of reversing, uh, if possible, the early disease, and then um, as an additional sort of follow, you know, add on to facilitate acceptance of eyelid implants, right? Because Vertex moving ahead, uh, you know, could, do, do you envision a time sort of a thought experiment that you could come up alongside them and, um, add value there. Yeah, perhaps I can I can take a first pass at this question, Hogan, and you you complement it. Um, certainly we intend to explore thymic preservation in in people who still have a functional thymus. That will be with drugs, not with uh, techs or TEPs. And in theory, because that has not been done so far, but in theory, it should lead to lower incidence of autoimmune diseases. And there will be an element of uh, preservation of, of immune competence, of prevention of disease. Potentially, you start to get into areas of longevity and increase in health span. Then the second approach, as you said, is uh, the, the treatment of ongoing disease um, by biasing that thymic organoid towards tolerance and autoimmunity towards 
breaking tolerance in cancer. And that will build on the uh, thymic organoids, but will combine other elements as well. And then finally, as you said, transplantation is a very clear area of opportunity where uh, you could very possibly combine a graft with thymic tissue from the, the same donor and that thymic tissue would result in removal of graft reacting T cells and generation of graft protecting T rex as well. Um, and and we're, we're sure that area is going to be explored by us and by others as well. Uh, as you said, Monica, it's a nascent field and there are two or three additional companies that have declared their interest in thymus, but they are all kind of in stealth mode. Uh, today is our first presentation, so we are coming out of stealth ourselves through you, but it's going to be very interesting in the near future. It's fantastic. And I remember actually when we hosted you when you first came out of stealth for prevention too. So um, I'm very uh, optimistic that you're going to really um, add value to the field of type 1 diabetes. Here's a couple more questions. Um, we'll just take a few more uh, from uh, Alison Bayer to see T1D ant autoantigens is promising, but can these cells be engineered to express other antigens such as neoantigens, cryptic antigens, HIPs, et cetera, to direct specificity out? Specificity, specificity of Tregs, perhaps. Yes, absolutely. We're thinking of that as well. Engineered or just loaded with antigens. Yeah. Um, and then the one more question has has this been applied already in clinical trial? No. Um, other... All no. All the companies working in this space are preclinical. Of course, there is a company called Rethymic that got approval for cadaveric or donor thymic slice transplant. This is a bit like in the T1D field, cell trans got approval for islet transplantation, right? They got the process through the FDA and SEMA and now Vertex try to improve on that by unlocking the, the accessibility and the scale up by developing iPSC derived beta cells. So in a way, Rethymic is equivalent to cell trans in T1D and we and Thymune and others are equivalent to SEMA Vertex. We are trying to leverage iPSCs to scale up and increase accessibility. Got it. Um, all right, then. All right. Uh, we're at the, at the end of our time. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, we're really um, hopeful and optimistic uh, about your approach and think that uh, it has uh, really just so much potential and potential for, um, you know, streamlining this, this approach and, and moving it forward more quickly. So thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, Monica. And thank you to everybody who's called in. All righty. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. And it's nice to see you all. Thanks. Great to see you again. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Have a great rest bye -bye. of the day.